my name is Alex, uh, and let's talk about uh, well uh, BFT consensuses in uh, in their applications in blockchain. So this talk will be roughly split into two halves. In the first half, I will talk about uh, in general uh, how BFT consensuses work and uh, how they are applied in, in blockchains. Uh, what implications does it have uh, if we compare to uh, to other approaches to building blockchains? And in the second half, I will talk about Doomslug. Uh, which is not a DFT consensus per se, but it's a very interesting construction we proposed last year that we use in NIR. Uh, and, uh, and I will talk about the, the trade-offs in Doomslag and how it affects uh, finality or performance. A little bit about myself. I, uh, I'm one of the co-founders of NIR Protocol. I hope most of you heard of NIR. Uh, and uh, before NIR Protocol, I was working for a company called MemSQL. Uh, I joined MemSQL in 2011 as the first engineer when it was uh, just uh, three people in an apartment with a Pomeranian. And I left MemSQL several years later when it was 150 uh, people's company uh, selling uh, uh, with deployments uh, in every other Fortune 500 company. And so MemSQL is a sharded database. And so I went to found near protocol uh, to uh, to use the, the experience. I got at MemSQL to build sharded uh, blockchains. Before MemSQL was at Microsoft, uh, before Microsoft, I was participating in uh, uh, what is called ACM ICPC, which is a programming championship among uh, college students where me and my teammate, we got gold medal uh, in the world finals. And, and my teammate also works for New York Protocol now. So uh, both of us are <clears throat> there with a couple other friends from uh, from the same community. And uh, what NIR is, if you have never heard of it before, uh, it's a layer one protocol. It's uh, in the same space as Ethereum, Polkadot, Cosmos, and others. Uh, and the primary focus of NIR, uh, it's not as much scalability, uh, which many other protocols uh, focus on today. Uh, it's more to build a protocol which people can build applications for, and, and then uh, the users can actually use those applications later. Right. So Ethereum today, and, and, and practically every protocol that exists, uh, they have quite a few hurdles to build for them and they have even more hurdles for for a person to use applications built for them and so we're trying to to remove as many of them as possible to make it such that people just build applications the way they build them today uh for actual for, for like uh for web 2 for web uh, and then the users use them exactly the same way they would have used regular applications but they use get all the benefits of blockchain such as uh, data sovereignty and uh, uh asset transfers uh transactions which are which which are private etc uh, even though scalability is not our primary focus near is uh, uh, we, we do pay attention quite a bit to scalability. It scales via sharding uh, the same way that uh, Ethereum is planning to scale Ethereum 2.0. Uh, and near what, what what is different between near and uh, many protocols which emerged in uh, in the wave of like 2017, 2016 is that near is not coming from academia. We're coming from industry. We have multiple people from MSQL. We have many people from Google, uh, from Facebook, from Niantic everybody with many years of industry experience building actual uh, production systems. And we have, besides myself and my teammate, we have other people who also perform very well at ICP. So we have 12 people who went to the finals, uh, six six gold medals. So it's a, it's a pretty strong uh, industry team. And we're not talking about sharding today, we're talking about consensus. Uh, but if you are interested in uh, in sharding and in general how NIR compares to uh, Ethereum 2.0, uh, we actually just published a week ago a video where Justin Drake from Ethereum uh, Foundation uh, and I would talk about differences between Ethereum and Near. Uh, and if you if you want to watch it, there's a short link uh, with the catchy but incorrect name, near.ai slash if2 is near. Cool. Okay. So now let's talk about the actual uh, BFT consensuses. So first of all, uh, I, Near was founded in the in the late 2018, right? So now is uh, 2020. So it's been a year and a half. And in one year and a half, this is the first time we ever talk about this is the first presentation we give on consensuses, right? And again, that uh, uh, it's an, in, in contrast to many other protocols for whom cons their consensus algorithm is often at the forefront of their uh, marketing, right? So why uh, we don't talk as much about consensus uh, is, uh, as a matter of fact, consensus is very rarely what brings you the throughput, right? So so if someone goes and pitches saying, you know, like we ha we have. We have a novel consensus. It's uh, it brings us ten thousand transactions per second, hundred thousand transactions per second. It is very often not the consensus which actually brings the benefits, because even if you replace today in Ethereum uh, their existing longest chain consensus with something that can produce blocks every second, uh, and every second is very it's very very fast. If you think about it, 
uh, g- given that the round trip between China and US takes 300 milliseconds, uh, that will only bring Ethereum to 200 transactions per second. Right? There are many other bottlenecks that need to be overcome in order to create a blockchain which can scale way beyond that. Right? First of all, uh, there's a network overhead. Right? You actually need to send those transactions around. Uh, second of all, there is an overhead of computing so-called state root, which requires your computing a uh, large number of SHA 256s every time you touch any account. And each of those uh, is is not easily removable or changeable. So, so building an actual blockchain which can scale way beyond 200 transactions per second cannot be done just by replacing the consensus. And so often when you hear the claim that uh, that says something along the lines of consensus bringing 10,000 transactions per second, that often is in the context of very well optimized network between the participant, uh, rem- not computing the state route, uh, et cetera. Uh, but all, each of those is is uh, is reducing the security of the system, right? So each of them needs to be considered independently when, when looking at it. However, uh, consensus does bring you uh, certain benefits, right? If you can bring, if you can replace the consensus with something uh, significantly better, it can significantly increase latency, uh, improve latency, right? So if today in Ethereum the blocks are produced every 14 seconds uh, and time to finality is measured in minutes, if not hours, uh, if it was a BFT chain. It would ha- it would enjoy uh, significantly faster block times and significantly quicker uh, time to finality. You can get uh, to uh, like five seconds easily uh, uh, with uh, using something like Tendermint, uh, both time to finality and block times. Uh, but second of all, it also makes your reworks significantly more expensive uh, if you use uh, a consensus, uh, some sort of a BFT consensus where where uh, failures are attributable, and we're going to talk about it in a second. <clears throat> than, than if you just use the longest chain uh, where to create a fork, you just need to undo uh, recent work that was performed. Uh, and so let's quickly talk about what is, in general, what is consensus on blockchain, why why it exists, what it does, what is uh, uh, what is effectively happening. So if you think about the blockchain, in the blockchain, uh, every block contains some set of transactions, right? So if you go very far to the left, there's some genesis state uh, in which maybe nobody has any coins or uh, some of them are already distributed somehow, and every block contains some modifications uh, to that state, right? So in uh, uh, historically, that uh, that list of modifications is called ledger in the blockchain space. Uh, if you if you come from databases, you would call the transaction log. Uh, what is important about uh, these blocks, this transaction log, is that it it must not change, right? The history might not uh, should not be it should not be possible to rewrite the history, right? So for example, if there's a particular block. Uh, let's say this one in which there's a transaction which uh, which sends me money. For me, it is very important to know that this block will remain on chain forever, and that at some point nobody will create another block and effectively write the history and send the same money not to me but to someone else, and I will effectively lose them. And that is uh, reaching the consensus is effectively agreeing uh, around all the users of the blockchain that this block is final and is not going anywhere. And the way consensus works in classic blockchains such as Ethereum, Bitcoin and others uh, is every block contains some amount of work that was done uh, and and effectively this block uh, by having by, by ha- having some other block as its previous it endorses the previous block and all blocks be, 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 uh, before it and so if there is some if the block that contains the transaction I need has uh, has a large number so so there are three on the picture but let's say there are 20 blocks being built on top of it uh, all that work uh, now uh, endorses the corresponding blocks where it is included, but it also includes the block in which my transaction uh, uh, appears. And for someone else to rewrite the block, they will have to redo all the work that, that happened that was done on top of my block. Uh, and unless they control 50% of the uh, of all the uh, compute power that performs the work, uh, the, the existing chain, the canonical chain, will always be running away faster from them than they will be catching up, and so they will never overtake. And so that is effectively how the consensus works uh, in the in existing proof of work chains, uh, and it has it has many huge benefits. Uh, one of them is that it's permissionless. It has drawbacks, right? So one drawback is that trees get burned. Uh, the second uh, big drawback is that time to finality is very large, right? It takes many many blocks to be built uh, before we have any meaningful sense of finality. Uh, and the third large disadvantage is that uh, even even if there were many blocks built. Uh, even though it never happened in practice, it is not impossible to imagine uh, someone spending a lot of money to corrupt people with ASICs. So if you think about it, in Bitcoin today, every 10 minutes, there is a block produced which has uh, 12, 12 Bitcoin uh, minted, right? And, and very soon it's going to be six, if, if not yet. 
um, then that means that approximately one Bitcoin is paid to the all the miners combined every minute. So let's say I transferred 7,000 Bitcoin in one transaction, uh, and then I, I realized I, I made a mistake or I want to intentionally uh, uh, attack whomever was the recipient of funds. Those 7,000 is actually more than sufficient uh, to pay a huge uh, bribe to all the major ASIC holders for them to start building on the on the block, which is not the tip of the canonical chain, but some previous block, right? For them, what they lose uh, is they lose one Bitcoin per minute that was uh, that was minted throughout this history, right? Uh, but they might benefit significantly more if I pay them, like for example, if out of seven thousand bitcoins I pay them one thousand, that's a huge, uh, that's a huge amount of money for them. That's one thousand uh, minutes of, uh, well, not huge, but it's it's quite a bit of money, As, especially if we're paying uh, to a subset of them, right? So it's uh, uh, even though it never happened, we we were very close to that happening, right? Many people were suggesting this year of Binance uh, when seven thousand bitcoins were stolen from them uh, to just publish the public the private key from that money and see. Uh, if that creates any interesting uh, effects in the market, I, they did not do that. Uh, but the question is, can we can we actually get instant finality? Can we get to a state where after the block is published, uh, we get uh, we get some sense of finality on that block uh, that effectively convinces us that that block will never be uh, unrolled? Uh, and the second question is, can can we also significantly increase the cost of the fork? Right. So can we? Uh, can we make it not to be just the cost of the recent changes? Can can we actually be something on the order of the total supply uh, of all the tokens? And so BFT finality, BFT consensuses can give you both of those properties, not for free. They have their own cost. Uh, and so let's quickly talk how it is done. Uh, we're going to make two assumptions at the beginning, and then we're going to see uh, how we can relax them and what sort of consequences those assumptions bring us. So first, let's say that the set of validators who produce blocks is fixed. That is not the case in Bitcoin and Ethereum. In Bitcoin and Ethereum, uh, the set of people who produce blocks uh, is not known to everyone, everybody, and it is not fixed by anyone. And it is not, you don't need anyone's permission to start mining blocks, right? You just need compute power. And BFT consensus, and uh, the classic BFT consensus is the set of uh, participants is always considered to be fixed. Uh, and also, let's make an assumption that less than one third of them are bad, uh, where uh, we're going to use a very relaxed definition of bad for now. For now, let's say that bad is someone who just deviates from the protocol and not bad uh, and, and who's honest is someone who follows the protocol strictly. Uh, then most of the BFT consensus work in a very similar fashion. We will use PBFT as an example. Uh, there's one particular participant who is chosen as a leader. Uh, and if you watch the presentation approximately a couple hours ago about Honey Badger uh, BFT, uh, so, so that's an example of a consensus where there is no leader. Today, we're going to primarily talk about the consensus, which are not leaderless, right? So in BBFT, in Tendermint, uh, in hot stuff, these uh, always uh, in every round, in every uh, in every view, uh, in every every time we produce a block, there's one participant who's chosen to be a leader uh, who will carry out the consensus. Uh, what they do is they first propose the block, right? So the very first step is uh, they, they're proposing a particular block and they're sending that block to every other participant. Uh, and every other participant, what they do uh, is after receiving the block from the leader, uh, they send a message back to the leader saying, uh, and that message is called a pre-vote. They're effectively saying, I vote uh, that we actually do produce that block. And once the leader collects two thirds of those pre-votes, uh, they send, uh, and they cannot wait for more than three uh, two thirds because we assume that that, that uh, slightly less than one third is malicious, right? And so it could be that malicious actors never respond, right? So the leader, the moment they respond, they receive two thirds pre-votes, uh, they send. Uh, those aggregated pre-votes to everybody saying, okay, guys, we have two, two thirds of pre-votes. Uh, let's agree on this block uh, to which every participant sends back a message called pre-commit saying, okay, yeah, we, we agree that we should uh, proceed with this block. And the moment the leader uh, accumulates two thirds of pre-commits, uh, that's a commit. That means that the block is ready to be produced. Uh, and this message, the aggregated pre-commits uh, is a proof that that block cannot be reverted in perpetuity. Cool. Uh, so that's the very basic overview of... Uh, of the optimistic uh, scenario, and then once the block is published, uh, the next leader or the same leader that that's uh, uh, that's sort of the detail of the particular protocol on top of PBFT. Uh, it could be the next leader, could be the same, could be random one uh, takes over and, and and proposes the new block on top of the of the block that was just committed. Uh, so when we talk about BFT consensus algorithms, uh, there are two properties that we care about. One is called safety. Uh, and safety means that if Alice believes 
uh, that the consensus was reached on some outcome A, and Bob believes that the consensus was reached on some outcome B, it must be that A is equal to B. Otherwise, it's not. Uh, otherwise, the consensus is called not safe. And this, the, the situation in which Alice believes the consensus was reached on one outcome and Bob believes it was on another, it's called a safety failure. Uh, and there's another property that we want from the consensus algorithm, which is uh, we want the consensus to never stall. All right. And so the PBFT that I just described, uh, the optimistic, if we only have this optimistic part, it can easily stall, right? If the leader is offline, right? And uh, they do not send any messages to other participants, there's no way for them without some other technique uh, to, to make any progress, All right? And so there's a technique in PBFT, effectively in PBFT, uh, what happens is that uh, every participant has a has a timer uh, in which they uh, they measure how much time has passed since the uh, since the uh, uh, it's called the view since the view has started uh, and and uh, if the if there is no commit by the time the the timer runs out uh, they propose to change the leader right uh, and that particular process of proposing to, to change the leader and actually changing the leader is very involved. Uh, it requires quite a bit of machinery to make sure that uh, uh, that, when the, that if it happened that, uh, so let's say the first leader is Alice. If it happened that Alice actually did uh, get to the commit uh, and then she just didn't happen, didn't manage to send the commit to others in time. And so they switched the view and now the Bob is, is the new leader. Uh, it must be the case that Bob ends up with the same uh, commit. Because otherwise we will have a safety failure because Alice believes the consensus was reached on, out on one outcome and Bob believes it was reached on the other outcome, right? And moreover, it should never be the case that, uh, that some participants believe we're already in view four, for example, and some participants still believe in, uh, we're in view two. And so to uh, to make sure none of that happens in PBFT, there is a relatively involved procedure called the view change, uh, where in order for Bob uh, to actually start their view, Every participant needs to change to send them a pretty expensive message called the view change message, and the Bob needs to send everybody a very expensive message called uh, the new view, new view message. And optimizing the view change has been uh, something many uh, many protocols were doing. So you you you, you might have he heard of some versions of fast BFT, practical B, uh, or like uh, some BLS aggregated BFTs, etc. Uh, however, even better than uh, uh, than optimizing the view change. It would be even better if we can completely remove the view change. Uh, and so there's a particular consensus uh, called Tendermint. Uh, that's a consensus protocol used in Cosmos, for example, but it, it is actually used in, very, in, in, many, uh, in many protocols today. Uh, so in Tendermint, uh, it is very similar to, uh, to PBFT, right? So, so if there are, uh, let's say, four participants, let's call, call them Alice, Bob, Carol, and Dave, uh, and they all collectively want to reach a consensus on the block, uh, it is very similar to PBFT in the sense that uh, at the beginning, uh, Alice uh, proposes some block and she creates a message. Uh, and that message contains the block that she proposes. Uh, and she sends it to every other participant, so to Bob, to Carol, and to Dave. Uh, but when Bob, Carol, and Dave receive it, uh, one thing that Tendermint changes is that instead of sending responses back to Alice, uh, they actually broadcast their pre-votes, right? So they create a message uh, that says, I pre-vote uh, on, uh, on B1. Uh, and they send that message to uh, to everybody uh, via the gossip uh, network. Uh, and so now, instead of instead, uh, go ahead. Uh, which slide are we supposed to be on? Because uh, on my screen, I, I actually see consensus does not equal throughput. Is that accurate? Uh, hmm. I think we're missing a well, visual. We should see the whiteboard. That's actually what I see on the in the video. What, what do others see? Do you guys see the the slide, or do you see the uh, the whiteboard? Can anybody else confirm? I'll, I'll keep playing with it. That's interesting. Let me see. Maybe I can fix it on my end. Let me just start the sharing again. Uh, can you see the whiteboard now? Yes. Okay, cool. Okay, and so instead of uh, instead of sending um, now instead of Alice aggregating all the uh, pre-votes and sending them back, each participant independently through the gossip network accumulates two thirds of pre-votes, and let's say Bob received. Uh, 
three votes from two thirds of the participants, right? So he, uh, Bob now has uh, two thirds of pre-votes. Uh, in, instead of sending the aggregated pre-vote, they will just send a message uh, that can that says, okay, I saw the uh, two thirds of pre-votes, I will send a pre-commit uh, on B1. Uh, they send it to everybody and once, and everybody independently will accumulate two thirds of pre-commits on B1. And once they accumulated two thirds of pre-commits on B1, uh, uh, they will reach the commit. And so the second big change uh, that Tendermint has done is that instead of having one large timeout for the entire view, they have timeout for every round. So, so every every participant will have a separate timeout to wait uh, to wait to receive the proposal. Uh, they will have a separate timeout uh, to wait uh, for the pre-vote, and they will have a separate timeout to wait for the pre-commit. Uh, and if they do not receive the pre-vote, instead of moving immediately, sorry, if they do not receive the proposal in the block, so if Alice is offline and the proposal is not received, instead of moving to the next uh, view entirely, they just pre-vote, they just send a message that say, that say instead of pre-voting, so let's say Carol never received the block, she will just say, I'm pre-voting on Neil, where Neil is a special kind of message that says that she has not received the block, and so she's pre-voting uh, on, on no block. Uh, and so... Uh, in the next phase, in the pre-commit, in the next round, uh, if they receive uh, two-thirds, Carol might still now receive two-thirds of pre-votes on B1. Hers is not going to be one of them, but if she does receive two-thirds of pre-votes on B1, she will still pre-commit on B1. If she does not receive two-thirds of pre-votes uh, pre on B1, uh, she will pre-commit on, on Neil. Uh, and it, at the end of the day, if we receive two-thirds of pre-commits pre on Neil, or if we don't receive two-thirds of pre-commits at all by the end of the, uh, the pre-commit timeout, uh, then we move to the next view, but we don't need to send any messages to the next leader. We don't need to send any, uh, we don't need to receive any message from the next leader. Uh, the view change happens automatically. And so tendermint significantly improves the simplicity of the protocol. First of all, it is way easier to reason about tendermint. It's way easier to reason about liveness of tendermint, uh, but also it improves significantly the number and the sizes, more importantly, of the messages which are being exchanged. Cool. And so tendermint, Okay, let me make sure that that, that worked. <clears throat> um, cool. Uh, so, Tendermint is extremely practical, uh, and Cosmos has been running Tendermint now for uh, for for more than a year, I think, if we include all the test nets uh, that they had. Uh, they didn't. I, I think like early on, they they might have had some glitches, but since Cosmos was live, there was no glitches. It, it runs very well. Uh, and Tendermint has uh, on itself benefits, which I, which I mentioned. It's very simple. Uh, it's uh, It has guaranteed liveness. And in general, if you use if you use a BFT consensus uh, as your consensus in the chain, it brings you quite a few benefits uh, compared to using any longest chain sort of consensus, whether proof of work or proof of stake. Uh, one is that the finality is immediate. Once the block is produced and signed by two thirds of the of the permission set, that block is reversible, assuming that one third of that permission set uh, is uh, uh, is following the protocol. Uh, second of all, in Tendermint uh, and in PBFT and in Hot Stuff and in every in most of the uh, existing BFT consensuses, the misbehavior is attributable. So if actually uh, if you, there was a fork, right? So let's say there was a block which was finalized by Tendermint, and then there was another block uh, which is not building on top of the of the first block. What that means is that uh, at least one third of participants has deviated from the protocol. Uh, but what is important is that for that one third of participants, we can provide a cryptographic proof of the deviation, right? So the two blocks will contain uh, the the trace of the messages exchanged during Tendermint consensus that resulted in the first block and in the second. Will, have, will, will contain messages which collectively can prove that the one third of the participants has misbehaved. And so we can introduce a technique called slashing. We can say that if such a proof is provided on any chain, uh, those participants are deprived of their stake. So, so they stake some money to, be, to get into the uh, permission set. And if the uh, proof of misbehavior is provided, some percentage of the entire or the entirety of the stake is, uh, is taken away from them. And so now the cost of the fork is significantly higher than in the longest chain because we don't have to, uh, in, in order for a fork to occur, uh, the cost of it for the block producers is not just the cost, uh, is not just the reward of the of the blocks they, uh, uh, they're they writing. Uh, it's actually something that is proportional to their entire stake, which in itself is something on the order of the entirety of the, of the, of the circulating supply, right? 
in most of the proof of stake protocols today, such as Tezos, Cosmos, and others, the total stake is between 30 and 60 percent of the circulating supplies of tokens, right? So if we slash one third of that, that's something on the order or like just one order of magnitude, magnitude less than the total supply. Uh, it has, however, some disadvantages. So one big disadvantage is that permission, right? Uh, so we need some technique uh, how we sample the participants who will actually be carrying out the uh, the job of creating blocks, which for many people who uh, who, who actively follow, who who the proponents of the of the longest chain protocols, that's a very big deal. Uh, and the second problem is that if there's one third of participants who are offline, the protocol completely stalls. At Bitcoin, for example, for as long as there's at least one person doing proof of work, the Bitcoin will, comp will continue operating with some caveats. But in general, no matter what percentage of the hash power goes down, Bitcoin will not stop. Uh, here, uh, one third going offline will completely stall the protocol. Uh, and even though in practice, if you look at Cosmos again, uh, they've been maintaining 98, 99% uh, online since they launched. In practice, it is not impossible to imagine some event which will bring more than one third of line, right? One one cloud, if Google Cloud or Amazon Cloud goes down, most likely there is something on the order of one third of people who run their nodes in, in the cloud, right? Uh, if uh, if the big Chinese firewall goes down, right? If if the split between China and the rest of the world uh, is uh, is more or less equal, that means again more than one third will be offline. And moreover, it is not one third of the total population offline. It is one third of the sample which is actually producing blocks, which is a weaker condition than uh, than what we have uh, in the longest chain. Uh, so now, one interesting idea which was proposed is called finality gadgets. Uh, it is something that has been circulating, I think, for something like four or five years now. The idea of finality gadgets is 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 in, essentially instead of completely replacing a consensus uh, in the blockchain protocol, which uses proof of stake or proof of sorry proof of work or proof of stake, but with the longest chain instead of BFT, uh, it says instead of actually we, we will keep the consensus, uh, the longest chain consensus, right? So we will maintain liveness if a large percentage of participants goes offline, uh, and the and the block production is permissionless. Uh, however. Uh, there's going to be a permission set of participants uh, with a stake that will be exchanging some messages uh, within those blocks, uh, which will provide uh, full BFT finality on some blocks in the past. Right? So it could be that once this block was published, uh, the block, the second block here, uh, had full BFT finality just because of those messages exchanged. And once the next block is published, a couple more blocks get full BFT finality. And so finality gadget, it sort of brings you both of uh, best of the both worlds uh, in the sense that if, uh, if one third goes offline, the finality gadget will stall, uh, but the rest of the chain will continue operating, right? So you can still use your uh, Nakamoto sense of finality. Uh, and uh, again, uh, the, the perm permission set is only uh, maintaining the finality gadget, uh, but the actual chain can still be built in the permissionless fashion. Cool. And so now with all, all those uh, 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 intro information, uh, let's talk a little bit about Doomslag. Uh, so Doomslag is this interesting construction uh, that we uh, we use in near uh, as uh, something uh, <clears throat> as a block production effectively technique, uh, and so uh, Doomslag is also permissioned. It's not permissionless. Uh, it, it has some permission set of block producers, uh, and the way they operate, uh, the protocol is extremely simple, right? So at every height there are heights at which uh, participants want to produce blocks. So in this case, I have four heights: H0, H1, H2, H3, and at each height there is a particular block producer in the permission set assigned to produce block at that height. Uh, and uh, so let's say the block at, at height H0 was produced. Uh, the moment that block is produced and sent to other block producers, uh, they send what is called an endorsement uh, to the next block producer, right? So you can think of endorsement as a pre-vote. Uh, and the next block producer, the block producer at H1, cannot produce their block until until they received those endorsements from at least 50% of all the uh, of all the block producers, right? And so once they did receive 50% of the endorsements, they produce the block, and the block also in itself includes the uh, the actual endorsements, right? So everybody can verify uh, that uh, the block producer at H1 actually had all the endorsements necessary to produce the block at at height H1. Uh, and then one, once B1 is produced, everybody sends endorsements. Uh, to the block producers at H2. Uh, and if within a certain time bound, they did not receive the block at H2, uh, they start sending uh, a separate kind of message called a skip message to the block producer at, at H3. And again, if within some larger time bound, they did not receive uh, the block at B3, they would also send skip messages to H4, etc. 
uh, but if H3, the block producer, was online and received the skip messages, uh, they will produce a block that will include those skip messages. And so Boom Slack has two very nice properties. Uh, property number one is that it has guaranteed liveness. So it is guaranteed that within finite amount of time, there is there, there is always going to be a block produced as long as at least 50% of participants plus at least one more participant is online. Uh, the second nice property that Boom Slack has is that if there are two blocks at two consecutive heights produced, uh, then the block at the pre, so in this case, H0 and H1, now the block at H1 is irreversible unless at least one participant gets slashed, right? So it's a weaker condition than one third of participants getting slashed. Uh, but if you think uh, about like practical uh, deployments of proof of stake chains today, majority of them have on the order of hundreds of participants uh, with very large stakes. And so for many use cases, maybe not if you transfer something on the order of tens of millions of dollars, but if you're sending hundred dollars or thousand of dollars to someone, that is actually a very meaningful sense of finality because someone, even one person being slashed is significantly more expensive than the amount of money transacted in a single block, right? Uh, but the, the beauty is that Dooms like will work with just 51% of the participants, right? So to stall Dooms like you need 40 more, significantly more than one third of line. Uh, and, uh, and there's an argument that states that uh, allowing more than 50% of participants going offline uh, effectively can, can, can bring you to a situation where you have a large blockchain built by participants by, by like 45% of the entire stake, while the remaining 55% was actually online and operational and creating some other chain. It was just there was a network split between the two of them, right? And so the other chain at some point significantly later can can surface itself, right? So that is uh, that, that, that is a paradox known as cap theory, which says that you cannot simultaneously require uh, the protocol to be operational when less than 50% of participants are online and at the same time uh, guarantee any sense of finality in that case, right? And so uh, Dooms like effectively favors safety over, 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 sorry, favors consistency over availability uh, and it operates at the highest number of offline people possible before, uh, before it would have to, to favor availability over consistency. Uh, and if we compare how Dooms like, so the way we use Dooms like is we still want to get a, a meaningful sense of BFT finality. Right, and so we use Dooms like uh, together with the with the finality gadget, and so uh, effectively what happens is that Dooms like produces blocks uh, optimistically. Right, there's going to be no skip, so at every height there's going to be a block. So in this case, I have a diagram where x axis is the uh, is time, and on y axis uh, is the uh, is the blockchain built so far. So Dooms like after every uh, communication round between the participants, a new block is produced, right, and the Dooms like has its own finality on the previous block immediately where the dooms like finality is effectively saying uh, the block is irreversible at, at least until, unless at least one person is slashed. And there's a finality gadget running behind dooms like uh, which finalizes blocks two heights back, right? So once B2 is produced, B1 has dooms like finality and B0 has full BFT finality on it. So now to reverse B0, you actually need to slash one third of participants, All right? And if you compare dooms like uh, to Tendermint or Hot Stuff or any other BFT consensus, uh, in 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 tendermint BFT and etc. In optimistic case, it will take two rounds of communication, pre vote and pre commit, before the block is produced, right? And then another pre vote and pre commit before the, another block is produced. While Dooms like is producing block every round of communication, so it produces blocks twice as frequently. Uh, the throughput in terms of number of blocks is higher. However, the latency is actually exactly the same. So if you think of tendermint, uh, from the moment B zero is produced until B zero has full BFT finality, it was exactly two rounds of communication. Which is the same for Doomslag, right? B0 was produced at some uh, at moment zero. It's two rounds of communication later that B0 is final, and when B1 was produced, it's two rounds of communication later that B1 is final. So Doomslag does not improve uh, uh, on uh, on the latency, on on time to finality, but it does improve on the block time, uh, which is in practice very important because uh, the full BFT finality takes something on the order of three seconds, uh, and usually the timeout would be a little higher. So the block time would be configured to be something like five seconds. So with uh, with looms like that reduces it to uh, something between one and uh, one and uh, two and a half seconds, which is significantly <clears throat> like from user from user's perspective, reducing the latency by half is actually something very noticeable, uh, and so it creates significantly better user experience when they interact with such a chain. Uh, and this slide. Uh, I don't know if you guys can, can see it when it's so small, but it, it shows the, the less optimistic scenario. And in the less optimistic scenario, 
uh, when there are several consecutive uh, block producers who are offline, the tender mint will take time, which is equal to approximately two, two rounds of communication multiplied by number of block producers that are offline. While hot stuff, which we didn't talk much about, but uses this concept of pipelining and boom slack, they will both take the number of rounds, which is uh, which is equal to the number of participants plus some constant number of offline participants plus some constant. So on average, if there's a large number of offline block producers uh, who are consecutive, or if there is a network glitch, which uh, and the network for some time is is uh, is not operational, uh, hot stuff and dooms like. Uh, will be twice as performant as tender mint <clears throat> in a situation like that. Cool. Okay, so that's uh, that's the introduction to Doom Slack and the uh, overview of some BFT consensus that exists today. Uh, as a closing note, uh, I want to mention that we run this uh, effort called Open Web Collective. 